We're looking forward to it. Hopefully, you've begun inviting your friends, family members, coworkers to join us as we kick that thing off. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris. I'm the lead pastor here at Hoboken Grace. And I want to do something really quickly before we start. Uh, in our Grace Kids area, the oldest Grace Kids classroom is called Clubhouse. And as we come to the beginning of this upcoming school year, there are a group of individuals who are going to be graduating out of Clubhouse and who are going to be joining us here in this service. And so they've started to attend the service. Give me one second. Give me one second because I want for you to clap for them, but not right now. So, but, and, and so just in a few weeks, they're going to be joining us for this service. And, and in preparation for that, they've been coming down with their small group leader and they've been joining us in the service for the past couple weeks. So what I want for you to do and for us to do today is just to welcome them. So would you guys let them know that they're, we're excited to have them here with us? Now you guys get to be part of conversations that are sometimes going to make your parents nervous, but it'll be good. It'll be good. We are, we are really excited as we come together today because if you weren't able to be with us last week, right now we're ramping up for the fall. And in preparation for the fall last week, we talked about all of the different things that are available to you as part of Hoboken Grace for you to continue finding your way back to God, to continue taking next steps. And one of the things that was really exciting coming out of last week is that what we thought was true is exactly what was true. Because after almost every service, people came up to me and said, I had no idea. I had no idea. I had no idea. Because for many of you, you thought maybe there's a couple opportunities, but there's literally tons of opportunities for you to be able to take next steps. And it was really exciting as well because there were a lot of really great conversations in dinner groups. And then we also saw just... I think we had over 30 people sign up to take a next step last week, which is awesome. And that was just on Sunday. I don't know what's happened since then. So it, it's really, really cool to see more and more of you beginning to take those next steps. But as we prepare for the fall, we didn't just want to let you know about those steps. We wanted to actually help you take a couple of those steps. And so if you remember last week, inside of that booklet where we told you about all the different classes that are available, one of them was called Intro to Impact. It's a class that we ask everyone to take before they begin to serve here at Hoboken Grace or as they're beginning to serve here at Hoboken Grace. It just talks through, okay, what is an impact team for? And, and, and how do they work? And, and what's important to know as you get plugged in and you begin to serve in this way? And so what we want to do today is not just let you know about Intro to Impact, but we want to actually walk you through it, which is why we started a little bit earlier than we did before, than we usually do. There's only one song at the beginning because we've got a lot to cover, and we want to walk you through this class. So here's what I want you to do. First things first. Take out that connection card that you're sitting on or that you came in with and wave it at me. Wave it at me. Yes, even those of you who think that I can't see you. Yes, you too. Right? Listen, you want to fill this thing out. You don't have, if you've been here before, you don't have to put all your information, but you want to put your name on this thing. And later on in the service, I'm going to give you a chance to be able to hand it in because here's, here's why. Here's why. If you don't fill this out and you get plugged into an impact team here at Hoboken Grace, you're going to have to take this class again. But if you fill it out and hand it out, you will be on record as having taken this class. Okay? So make sure, make sure that you turn this thing in. This is what will qualify you and set you up and prepare you to be able to serve on an impact team here at Hoboken Grace as we move into the fall. And really for all of us, for every single one of us as we move into the fall, I want to see us move from observers to participants. From observers to participants. As we look at this past year, our church has grown tremendously. Year-over-year year growth, we're up about 40% of where we were last year. When you look at our dinner groups, we've grown tremendously. The one area where we haven't grown is in our impact teams, at least not at the, at the pace that we're growing in other areas. And, and what we want to do and what I want to do today is I want to help you take that step from being an observer to a participant, because many of you are observers. You're coming in here on Sunday morning, and you're observing what's happening. You're observing what God's doing. You're observing how God is working and moving in the world around you, but you're missing out on the opportunity to participate in that with him. 
And I want for you to be able to step into all that God has for you in, in serving with him. And I think for, for many of us, the reason why, the reason why we don't get plugged into service, why we don't join an impact team, why we, why we don't begin serving as a part of this family is because we don't understand it. And I think for many of you, you don't, you don't understand it. And there, there are lies that creep into this, and there, and there are things that keep us from this. And so what I want to do today is I want to address some of those as we walk through this class that was known as, as Intro to Impact. In the future, it's actually going to be known as Engage. And, and so we want to walk through that together this morning. The, the truth is that every single, every single impact team at Hoboken Grace exists for one reason. And that is to accomplish the mission. Every single one. And, and as Anthony said earlier, our mission here at Hoboken Grace is very clear. We are here to help people find their way back to God. That mission comes out of Acts chapter 17, verse 27. Some of you don't know this. You hear us say the mission, but you don't know where it came from. Acts chapter 17, 27 says this. It says, His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. Every single one of our impact teams exists to accomplish that mission. And every single one of them is crucial in that. And every single one of them works together to be able to accomplish that. We, we, we strive hard to be one team, one family, one church moving in one direction. To be one team, one family, one church moving in one direction. And every single impact team fits into that. Every single team is contributing to that mission of helping people find their way back to God in their own unique way. And even in that, even in that, every single team member is contributing to that. And every single team member is important to that. Every single team member matters to the mission. It, one of the greatest gifts, listen, one of the greatest gifts that God has given you is the opportunity to matter. It's one of the greatest gifts that he's given you. Outside of Christ, we live our lives investing in things that will not matter. That one day will be done. They'll be gone. But one of the greatest gifts that God has given you is the opportunity to live a life that's actually significant. An opportunity to matter. And many of you don't believe this, but it's true. You matter to the mission. You matter to the mission. Listen to what, listen to what Jesus says about you, or what God tells us in 1 Corinthians about you. It says, yes, the body has many different parts. And when he's talking about the body, he, he, he's comparing the church body to our own physical body. He says, yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only has one part. Yes, there are many parts, but one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some of the parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And he's talking to us about this incredible truth, this incredible truth that every single piece of the body, every single person who's a part of this body matters. You matter to the mission. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, I matter to the mission. Yeah, that was pathetic. <laughs> you, said, you, you said it like you don't believe it. it uh, it's not very convincing. You're like, I, I matter to the mission. No, do you believe it? I want you to say to your neighbor, I matter to the mission. That's better. We'll see if we can work on that as we go through the day. You matter to the mission. This is so important for you to grab a hold of because some of you think, you think because of mistakes in your past, some of you think because of the fact that you're, you're not gifted the way the person next to you is gifted, or some of you think that you don't matter to the mission. That is not true. It's a lie. 
You matter to the mission. And if you're here today and, and you ha- you're, you're here exploring who God is, can I follow God, can I trust Jesus, all of this, listen to me, one of the, one of the greatest gifts that Jesus wants to give you is the opportunity to matter. Not only is he going to save you, not only does he want to forgive you, not only does he want to, to make you holy and clean, but he wants to give you the opportunity to matter. You matter to this mission. And what we, what, what we want to do and what impact teams are all about is helping us to be able to live that out together to accomplish the mission together as all of us step into it and say, okay, God, how can you use me as a part of this thing? And for us to be able to figure out how we work together and how we can accomplish this better and better and better, every single, every single team, every single team member, every single one of you, you matter to the mission. When I'm talking to our teams about this, one of the things that I often bring up is that when someone walks into a church, studies show that people make the decision about whether or not they're going to stay at a church within the first five minutes that they show up. Within the first five minutes. You know what that means? That means I can only screw it up. I have nothing to do with it. I have nothing to do with it. Even when you think about your experience of Hoboken Grace... Right? What was, it that, what, what was it that you loved about Hoboken Grace as you got connected here? Uh, almost every conversation I have with people, it's that, man, when I walked in, I felt like I was home. I just had that conversation a few, a few minutes ago. She said, I just feel like I'm home. I hear it all the time. You know why? Because there are teams who work really hard to love people really well and make sure that when people walk in here, they know not only that they're loved by God, but they they matter to us. They're loved by us. And the people who set up the space, the people who greeted the front door, all of those, every single team, every single person matters to the mission. If you're on a team right now, I want you to just take a couple seconds. Just think to yourself, how does your team contribute to the mission? You need to remind yourself of that because sometimes you get, you get fooled into thinking that your team is just accomplishing a task. It's about so much more than that. Your team is accomplishing the mission. And none of us do all of it. All of us do part of it. None of us do all of it, but all of us do some of it. You matter to the mission. And on impact teams, we want to give you the opportunity to do that, to live that out. Impact teams also exist to allow us to live out our core value of multiplication. 2 Timothy 2.2 says, You have heard me teach these things and have been, that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. We have been called to multiply. In other words, we have been called to take what we've been given from God and give it to someone else. It's that simple. It really is that you just take what you've been given and you give it to someone else. You don't have to give them something that you haven't been given yet. That's you, one, of the, one of the really beautiful things that Jesus does to his, tells his disciples is he says, I want you to be my witnesses. Oftentimes we think that we're supposed to be theologians for God. Jesus says, no, no, I don't want you to be a theologian for me. I want you to be a witness for me. In other words, I want you to take what you've seen and experienced of me and I want you to hand it to someone else. I don't want you to introduce them to a theory. I want you to introduce them to me. So take what you've been given and give it to someone else. When we talk about this, we introduce this process. It's really a process of multiplication. It's not just used here. It's used all over. It's used in the business environment. It's a process of multiplication. It says, I do, you watch, we talk. I do, you help, we talk. You do, I help, we talk. You do, I watch, we talk. You do, we talk. Typically, we talk about this as it pertains to leadership, but the truth is that this should be a part of every single one of our lives because this is what discipleship is. This is what discipleship is. And all of us have been called to multiply. All of us have been called to make disciples. Jesus gives us a mission. He says, listen, I want you to go into all the world and I want you to make disciples. Well, how do you do that? How do you do that? 
You be a witness. You share with the people around you what God has done in your life. You share your story. You share what you've seen and experienced of him. And then you begin to walk through this process. This isn't just a leadership development tool. This is, this is the multiplication tool. And this wasn't taught to us by a business guru. This was taught to us by Jesus. Because this is what Jesus did. Jesus came alongside of his disciples. He said, listen, I want you to come hang out. It's really amazing when you look at the beginning of Jesus' story with his disciples. It's not at all like the movie. Whenever you're watching the movie, you see blonde hair, flowy hair, Jesus walking down the seashore, and he whispers, come follow me. And all of a sudden, people follow. It wasn't magical like that. It wasn't weird like that. It wasn't crazy like that. The truth is that Jesus went to see John the Baptist. And John the Baptist starts to talk about Jesus to his disciples. And he says, listen, this is the one we've been waiting for. This is the one we've been waiting for. This is the one who's going to change everything. This is the one who's going to save us. And so his disciples start to hang out with Jesus. And Jesus says, listen, if you want to know more, why don't you come follow me? How about you come hang out with me? And the first thing he does, he just takes them to a party. He says, listen, come hang out with me. I'm going to this wedding. Takes him to the party, changes water to wine. They're convinced, they're sold, they're all in. You want to make friends? Turn water to wine. It, it, every time it works. He says, come on, come along, come, along, come along with me. And oftentimes we think discipleship, whenever, for some reason, almost every time I talk to, to someone about discipleship or making disciples, they start to talk to me about classrooms. And they started to talk to me about curriculum, and we're going to sit down around this, this table, and we're going to walk through this curriculum. That is not the example that Jesus gave us. When Jesus decided to make disciples, he didn't start a school. You don't make disciples in a classroom. You make disciples on a road. And so he said, come on. Come on. Come hang out with me. And then I'm going to do, and you're going to watch, and then I'm going to talk to you about it. You see it all the time. What is he doing with his disciples? I'm going to do this. You watch. Let's sit down and talk. You guys don't get it. Let's do it again. All right. Well, I'm going to do, and we're, you're going to watch, and then we're going to sit down and talk. You guys still don't get it. All right, let's go. And, and he's walking them through this process. But as you watch his relationship with them, as the, as the time goes by, it begins to change. And so now he's like, okay, I'm going to send you guys out for a little bit. And you're going to do, and I'm going to help, and then we're going to talk about it. They're like, I don't understand. We tried to cast out this demon. And it won't leave. And he's like, yeah, let's talk about that. What? He's walking them through this process. Until he gets to the point where he says, listen, I'm going to send you out for a long time now. And you're going to be on your own for a little bit here. And then you're going to come back and we're going to talk about it. He's walking them through this process. This is a process that we should be involved in in almost every area of life. This isn't just about reproducing leaders. This is about reproducing disciples of Jesus Christ. It, when, you, when you're looking at, okay, how am I, how am I going to impact my friends with who Jesus Christ is? There's two things to remember, to be a witness and to walk through this process. Invite them into it with you. Invite them into your life. Allow them to see how God is impacting your life. And then talk to them about it. Yeah, this is, how I deal with, this is how I deal with grief. It's a little bit different because of who I know Jesus Christ is. And then you begin to invite them into this mission with you. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people come to know Christ on impact teams because someone on the impact team invited their friend who didn't know Christ to come serve with them. When we first started Skyline, which is the church that I was a part of planting before Hoboken Grace, this happened everywhere, everywhere. Because we, did, we just didn't have very many people, and we didn't have enough people to serve, so we're like, listen, just invite anyone. If anyone you know will show up, invite them. My wife did this with one of her friends. She invited one of her friends who didn't know Christ to come serve with her. And her friend loved kids, loved to take care of kids, loved to serve kids. And so she just served with her and her kids, as, as Anna was serving the kids there at Skyline. And as she was serving, every week, Anna got the opportunity to, okay, I'm going to do this and you watch. Okay, now you're going to do it and, and then we're going to talk about it. And in the process, she came to know who Jesus Christ was. And the beauty of the fact that God had given her the opportunity to matter. 
This is something that we, that we should be walking people through all the time. And our impact teams exist to give you the chance to do that. If you're on an impact team right now, you just need to find. I, I, I constantly hear people talk about, okay, we need to recruit for teams. Really, all you need to do is just invite somebody to come along with you. Don't invite them to join your team. Don't invite them. Just invite them to come along with you. If you set up chairs, invite someone to come set up chairs with you. If you take pictures, come invite someone to come take pictures with you. If you're, if you're serving back on the soundboard, invite someone to just come. Hey, listen, just come hang out with me. You don't have to make a big commitment. You don't Just come serve with me, and then I'm going to do, and you watch, and then we're going to talk about it and what, why I do it and what I love about it and, 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 and how it's impacting the mission and how it matters. You're just walking them through this process over, 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 over again. This is what discipleship is. And impact teams give us the opportunity to do that. If we're going to follow Christ, if we're going to follow Christ and carrying out the mission that he's given us to make disciples, that's going to happen based on the relationships that you're able to build on impact teams and the relationships that you're going to build in those dinner groups. Where you can begin to walk people through this process as it pertains to them knowing Christ, as it pertains to them serving Christ, as it pertains to them leading others. We're constantly walking through that process. Impact teams exist to accomplish the mission. Impact teams exist to allow us to multiply ourselves, to to create disciples. And then impact teams exist for us to live out our purpose. For us to live out our purpose. Jesus says there's two, the two greatest commandments are this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have been created to serve. You have been created to serve. And we have been called into the role of a servant. Listen to what Philippians chapter 2 says. Whenever someone becomes a member here at Hoboken Grace, they're given a towel. On that towel, there's a passage that's embroidered. It's Philippians 2. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 says this. It says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. You have been called to be a servant. If we're going to become like Jesus Christ, we must become a servant I love, what, I love what it says in Philippians 2 because it says you must take on the posture of a servant. And we live, we live in an interesting tension with this. We live in an interesting tension with this because the truth is, the truth is that you have been adopted as the sons and daughters of God. Your ultimate relationship with God is that you are his children. Jesus Christ gave his life so that you could be forgiven And so that you could be brought back into his family. You have been adopted as sons and daughters of God. But, but we don't interact with him. We don't come to him necessarily in that way. And let me me show you. Let me show you what I mean. The, the, the The parable of the prodigal son captures this in a really beautiful way. In Luke chapter 15, and for those of you who don't know the story of the prodigal son, it's basically a story. Jesus is, is telling a story. He's like, listen, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. It, it's, it's like a son who disowns his father and then goes, he claims his inheritance, disowns his father, and goes and blows all of it because he lives like a fool, destroys his life, comes to the end of himself and realizes, listen, I'm going to die if I don't go back, and so I'm gonna go back to my father and just beg him to make me his slave. Beg him to make me his servant. If he can just, I don't need to be his son anymore. I don't need, he, he said, if he'll just take me back as a servant, that's all I can ask for. And so he goes back. Jesus is telling it because he's talking about our story and the fact that we've disowned our father and taken all that he's given us and foolishly just consumed it ourselves, how we destroy ourselves. And the son thinks, the way that many of us think, that when we go back, that, that the father's going to be angry and that the father's going to be disappointed and the father isn't going to want anything to do with him. But he doesn't. When he comes back, he wraps his arms around his son and he brings him back into the family. And once again, he restores him as his son. 
But, but listen, listen to Luke 15. As Jesus is talking about this moment where the sun comes back, it says, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But the father brings him back into the family. Now, what, what I love about this picture is that it captures the tension that we are called to live in. The truth is, we have been welcomed back into the family, but we must never lose the perspective of the prodigal son. That, the, that, that all I really deserve and the best that I could hope for and what I want more than anything else is just to be your servant. This is, this is why when you read through the New Testament, those who, those who were closest to God, they always referred to themselves the same way. They always referred to themselves the same way. I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. I'll just walk through a couple of these passages. So when you look at those who, who wrote the scriptures, those who were walking in intimacy and closeness with God, James when James is talking about himself, this is what he says. He says, this is a letter from James, a slave of God. Peter, this is the letter from Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul, this letter is from Paul, a slave of God. Epaphras, Epaphras, a member of your own fellowship and a servant of Jesus Christ. John, when John's talking about his experience with Christ, he says, this is a re revelation from Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants. And again, when you look at Philippians 2, it's calling us to this posture and position of servant. The truth is we have been adopted back into God's family, but we continue to move forward with the posture and position of servant. And it's by God's grace that I'm back in this family, but I will live the rest of my life just to serve you. I just want to serve you. Let me, let me ask you something. When you come to God, what's your posture? Do you come to God with the posture of a servant? Or do you come to God with the posture of an entitled child? I know what both look like because I've seen... And I've had the opportunity and the gift in my life to see people who truly carried themselves with the posture of a servant. I know what the posture of an entitled child looks like because I have three kids. <laughs> and all of us are born as entitled children. And we believe that we should be given everything. And we believe that we have the right to everything. And we believe that we deserve everything. Let me ask you something. What's your posture before God? You have been adopted as his son and his daughter. But, but, when you realize the depth of his grace, and when you confront the reality of what you deserve, you move forward with the posture of a servant. And when you understand that the God of heaven and earth became a servant for you. You move forward with the posture of a servant. Those who've been served, serve. And we have been served. In an overwhelming way, we have been served. And, and on this journey, on this journey, the truth is, our responsibilities may change. Our responsibilities may change, but our role never will. Listen very carefully to this. Our responsibilities may change, but our role never will. We will always be servants. That's who we are. That's what we are. And our impact teams... 
Give us the opportunity to be able to live that out and to live that out well. Matthew 23, 11 through 12 says, The greatest among you must be a servant. Must be a servant. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, I'm a servant. Some of you choked right here in your throat. You, 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 you're trying to say it, but... We're called to be servants. Now, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. There are some things that as you get plugged into impact teams and as you move from being a, an observer to a participant, that if you, if you come in with the wrong mindset, you're going to have a hard time. And it has everything to do with this idea of servant. For example, you're going to have a really hard time here at Hoboken Grace if you see yourself as a volunteer. If you see yourself as a volunteer. We are not volunteers. Volunteers have no responsibility. We have a responsibility. A volunteer is going above and beyond. A volunteer is giving that which is not expected. A volunteer is someone who's helping someone out. You're not helping God out. He has bought us with the death of his son. We are not volunteers. If you come into impact with the, with the mentality of a volunteer, that I'm helping someone out or I'm helping... No, 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 no. That's not the posture of a servant. We're here to serve. If you come in and you think, I'm above... If you, really, if you think that you're above any role, you're going to have a hard time here at Hoboken Grace. It's amazing to me. It happens far more than you, than you could possibly realize or that you could possibly think. But I'll, I'll oftentimes have people come to me who have come to the church a couple times, and they'll come up to me and say, Hey, listen, you know, Chris, I'm, I'm, I'm a really good speaker, so you know, whenever you want me to speak here at Hoboken Grace, just let me know. I say... And your name is? And usually in that conversation, as we're talking through it, I'll say to them, well, yeah, I'll tell you what, here's a great place to get started. How about you jump on our setup team and set up on Sunday morning? And almost every time they look at me and say, like, what do you mean? No, I'm just available to speak. Maybe I didn't tell you, I'm a gifted speaker. I know what you do. I just don't know what you are. And I want to know if you're a servant. Because God's ability to use you is dependent on your posture of a servant. And if you're above any role, if you walk in and say, well, I'm too good for that, or I don't, no, 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 no. No, we're servants. We're not above any of that. If you see yourself as the point, sometimes I'll talk to people and, and they'll come to me and say, you know, I'm, I'm stepping out of this team because they're just not, they're not building into me the way that I expected to be built into or I, I'm not getting anything out of this. You, you need to understand this. You need, you need to understand this. This is so important in your growth and development. This may be one of the most important things that you hear all day. Listen very carefully to this. Listen very carefully to this. What we are trying to do in your life and what God is trying to do in your life, maybe one of the most, most important things that God is trying to do in your life is that he is trying to get you to live selflessly. He is trying to move you to be. To become like Jesus Christ is to become a servant. A servant goes into nothing and says, what am I going to get out of this? A servant goes into everything and says, okay, what do I need to bring to this? One of the most important steps at the core of what it means to become like Jesus Christ is to begin to live life selflessly. 
And so one of the things that we want for you to experience on an impact team is selflessness, to be able to walk into it. And, and it's important to, for us training and equipping and all of those things are important, but we want to develop in every single one of us the, the ability to walk into these environments and into these moments, not saying, okay, what am I going to get? But walking into every one of them and saying, what can I give? Jesus didn't walk into our lives and say, what am I going to get? He said, what can I give? You're going to struggle if you see yourself as the point. Impact teams exist to accomplish the mission. Impact teams exist to help us multiply. Impact teams exist to help us live out our purpose and our role as servants. But if you're going to be able to do that and do that well, you have to understand how service is intertwined with experience. Specifically, when when I'm talking about experience, I'm talking about your experience of God. And your service is incredibly intertwined with your experience of God. Your ability to be a servant is incredibly intertwined with your experience of God. Some of you are sitting here, and, you're, and, and I told you to say you're a servant, and it was, you said it, but it was hard, and you're thinking to yourself, how in the world do you begin to develop the posture of a servant? You hear me talking about it, you see it and in Philippians, this idea that, okay, I'm supposed to have that same attitude that Christ had. I'm supposed to develop this mentality of a servant. I'm not supposed to be a volunteer. I'm supposed to be a servant. How do you begin to develop that? The truth is that it's not something that you do so much as it is something that you experience as you experience. Experience God. One of the most amazing things as you read through the scriptures is that every person who comes in contact with God immediately assumes the position of a servant. Immediately. As soon as they come in contact with God, what's the first thing they do? They fall on their face. Immediately. When John, when John comes in contact with, with Jesus, right? What's the first thing that happens to him? What's the first thing that happens in his life? He falls on his face. Isaiah 40, 31, when Isaiah comes in contact with God. Actually, I lost my place. There we go. Ezekiel. Ezekiel 3, 23. says, so I got up and went, and there I saw the glory of the Lord, just as I had seen in my first vision by the Kabar River, and I fell face down on the ground. John, in Revelation chapter 1, says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead, But he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. When you experience God, you fall on your face. And the more that you experience God, the more that it enables you to be able to move forward as a servant. If you want to live your life as a servant, you must be incredibly intentional about your experience of God. Because it's in that time with him. It's in those rhythms with him. It's as you're experiencing him over and over and over again that it brings you to that posture. It motivates our service. It purifies the motivation of our service. Some of you serve, and you serve a lot, but you're serving because you think that that's what makes you accepted by by God. And again, it's because you're not experiencing him. You need to be experiencing him because when you experience him, you're able to experience his grace, that he loves you even when you fail, that he loves you even when you didn't, mat- didn't make it, yeah, he loves you even when you feel like you didn't do enough. Your experience is what motivates you in service. It's what purifies your motives. It's what strengthens you in service. Listen to what Isaiah says in Isaiah 40, 31. He says, but those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. In Psalm 23, David talks about this as well, that it's his experience of God that strengthens him. It gives you the strength to keep going in service. Oftentimes people will come to me and say, listen, I, I feel like I'm getting burnt out. I'm serving on this team, but I think I'm serving too much, and so I'm going to step off the team for a little while. And they expect me to talk to them about their schedule and how frequently they're serving, but the first thing that I say to them is this, tell me about your experience of God. What does your personal time look, look like right now? 
Burnout is not the result of serving too much. Burnout is the result of experiencing too little. Listen very carefully to this. Burnout is not the result of serving too much. Burnout is the result of experiencing too little. I think if Paul were to hear the way that the church in the United States talks about burnout, I think he would throw a fit. If anybody should have burnt out, it was Paul. I mean, this guy was going 100 miles an hour, constantly giving everything he had to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ everywhere that he went. This guy was stoned outside of a city, and he got back up and went back into the city. Burnout is not the result of doing too much. Burnout is the result of experiencing too little. And when you're not experiencing God, you don't have the strength to serve the way he's called you to serve. If you're beginning to feel tired, don't stop serving and watch TV more. It's not going to bring you rest. If you're beginning to get tired, look at your experience. What does your experience of God look like? It's what strengthens us. It's what allows us to keep going. If you begin to allow your experience of God to suffer because of your service, you're setting yourself up for disaster. But it's amazing, and some of you are here right now. It's amazing how many times people will come to me and say, I I think I'm going to step out of service because I I just feel like I'm burning out. And I'll have that conversation with them, but they'll step out of service anyway. It's amazing how many times after that, within a month, they're no longer even a part of our church. You know why? Because they had neglected their experience of God. They had neglected their experience of God, and it left them dry in their service. But the only place they were still experiencing God was in their service. So when they stepped out of service, now they weren't experiencing him anywhere. And their faith took a nosedive. Your ability to serve is directly linked to your experience of God. You must, you must make your experience of him a priority if you're to serve well. And the great thing about this and the way that this works in our lives is that our service is fueled by our experience. But then in our service, we actually find the greatest experience of him. And so the two fuel each other and work hand in hand with each other to allow us to be able to do and be what God has called us to be. There's this amazing passage where Jesus is talking to his disciples and he talks to them about how they're going to serve him and how they're going to experience him moving forward. And he's telling it inside of this story. He says, but when the Son of Man comes into his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. And he's talking about the end. He says, listen, there's going to come a point at the end where, where I'm going to bring everybody together. He says, all the nations will be gathered into his presence, and he'll separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And then he tells them, he says, this is what it's going to be like. He says, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison or visiting you? And the king will say, I'll tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you are doing it to me. He says, you're going to experience me. Not only, does your, not only does your experience fuel your service, but in service, you get to experience him. And you're going to experience him in this really unique and powerful way. And, and let me just say this about this passage. Some of you think that this passage is about poor people. It's not actually about poor people. He says, when you did it to, to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters. He's talking about how we love each other. This, isn't about, this passage isn't about taking care of the poor. This is about how we love one another. It's, it's far bigger than that. And he's saying, as you serve one another, you're actually serving me, and there's an incredibly powerful experience of God in your service. We have been called to be servants. 
Every single one of us. And every single one of you, you matter to the mission. Say to your neighbor, I matter to the mission. It's not getting better. It, it's, it's, I matter to the mission. As we walk into this fall, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to move from being an observer to a participant. To believe God that you matter to the mission. Here's how we're going to do this. On that impact, on that connection card that you have there, if you're not currently on a team, here's what, what I want for you to do. On the comment section, just write, join a team. Write it down right now. Take out that card. All right, take out that card. Wave it at me again. Wave it at me again. All right. On that comment section, just write, join a team. We've developed a new team here at Hoboken Grace. It's called the engagement team. They're going to contact you and meet with you personally. They're going to walk you through everything that we do here at Hoboken Grace. We used to do this with emails and all this. We we're done with that. We're just going to meet with you one-on-one -on -one personally and walk you through it. Get to know you. What is it that you do? What is it that you love to do? What is it that fuels you? And, and get you connected where you can be a part of this mission in a really powerful way. Because you matter to the mission. So what I want you to do is just write, join a team. They'll contact you this week and set up a time for you to be able to walk through that together. Now, here's the thing. I know a lot of you aren't going to turn this in. I know it. So I'm going to use peer pressure to get this from you. <laughs> okay? One, because it's just foolish for you not to. You don't want to have to take this class again. You've just completed the class. You want to make sure that, you, that that gets marked down. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your card, and I want you to pass it that direction, which will be your right. I want you to pass it that direction to the end of the aisle, and we're going to collect them. If someone in your group doesn't pass it to you, give them a dirty look. <laughs> just kidding. You don't have to have to. We don't pass baskets here, but we do collect these cards occasionally. <laughs> so pass that down, and they're going to just kind of very carefully for the next little bit here, just collect those. Excellent. Listen. Listen. We've been given the opportunity. We've been given a mission We've been given a role. We've been given an example. We've been given an opportunity. And we've been given a gift. You matter to this mission. This fall, this fall, this fall, don't be an observer. Be a participant. Step into the role that God has given you. Allow it to be fueled by your, serve, by your experience of him. And in it, I'm telling you, in it, you're going to find an experience of him that is beyond what you've known. May we, may we be a family of servants. Will you pray with me? Father, as we talk through this and as we look at uh, what it is that you have called us to be. The truth is that we have been served in a remarkably powerful way. The truth is that you have served beyond what we could imagine. And so we come to you today with a posture of servants. We come to you with an incredible gratitude that you have given us the opportunity to matter. And Father, we want to do that well. We want to do that with all that we have. In Jesus' name.